Well, um, thank you to you all today for, for showing up for um, this live session. Um, it's lovely to be here and not least because it's great to be part of a community that's actually embracing the topic of the menopause, which um, I have to say is like huge credit um, to the team at Thrive. I think particularly Paul, um, who has, has definitely sort of embraced this and I think is a, a huge male ally um, in this area, but also Jody, I know is very passionate about it and Nicole um, has been hugely supportive in terms terms of um, putting this all together today. So thank you for that and for the fact that you're facing into um, some of those taboos um, because I think the menopause both personally and professionally um, remains as one of the last um, taboos that there are um, out there, um, particularly for women. Now, today um, we've got four sessions um, going forward, but the first one today is all about myth busting around the menopause. So we're gonna tackle some of those taboos and we're gonna silence some of the shame that typically comes um, with talking about the menopause. Now, um, as you know, I'm Carolyn Hobday, but I'm also known as the midlife mistress. Um, and I talk about all things midlife and actually um, just a little bit of a, a sweary warning because I'm about to consciously swear. Possibly later on, I might subconsciously swear, but at the moment I'm gonna swear. So if you don't like the swearing bit, you might wanna mute me for a second because basically as the midlife mistress I talk about twats now I talk about twats in terms of both kinds I talk about those twats who um, it's their behaviors that maybe make, make us question our confidence our identity our self-worth and sometimes that twat may well be us that makes us question all those things and then the other kind of twats that I talk about as the midlife mistress are the lady part kind so like the ones that go on down there so I talk about both kinds of twats. So that's what I do as the, the midlife mistress. And I go out and I talk about um, these issues around midlife, but particularly as we're talking about today around the menopause. Now, to tell you a little bit um, about my background story and why I'm passionate um, about what I do, um, I was busy trying for a baby um, at the age of 32 when I got told that my menopause was already over. So overnight at 32, I lost any hope of ever having children and I was suddenly thrust into this body that I didn't recognise. Essentially, I was kind of a 50 something year old woman in a 32 year old's body. Now, that came, as you can imagine, as like a massive shock um, to me and I knew nothing about the menopause. In fact, what was interesting when I eventually tracked back in terms of my menopause um, and my symptoms, it turns out that I think I was going through my menopause at the same time as my mother. And, um, you know, I knew nothing about it. My mum's menopause wasn't particularly bad. So even though I lived in a family that were, you know, taught quite openly um, and, were, you know, have very close relationships, um, we didn't actually really talk much about the menopause because, like I said, my mum's symptoms weren't particularly bad versus some of them. But at that point, I sort of had to track back through my medical history. And as I learned about the menopause, I then discovered that actually my menopause had started, I think, when I was about 19 years old. So I had something that's called POI, which is premature ovarian insufficiency, which is a very nasty sort of medical cold term for basically what is the premature menopause. So I was 19 when that happened um, to me and it started. So I then had to go through a huge education um, about the menopause and understanding like what that meant and who I was and what was going on in my body. And it actually became I have to say, pretty damn scary um, in terms of what I was experiencing, because the thing that I had to learn was the, the role that hormones play in so many of our body systems. And when you have an absence of those hormones, um, obviously the implications for that can potentially be quite severe. So um, it was a you know extremely difficult time um, for me. So I wanted to talk today about some of the facts around menopause, because like I said, I want to myth bust a little bit um, around what we might know or what we might hear, you know, and there's starting to be more stuff coming out in terms of the media, which is great. There are more people sort of um, openly talking about the menopause. But I do know from my own work and just my conversations with people that I know and friends of mine that actually there's a lot of misunderstanding around the menopause. And it's something that I'm passionate about changing, not just in the world of work but actually for women and for men I think it's really important that we take the guys with us on that education but actually particularly talking about like what is the menopause and what does it mean so 
just wanted to share with you today um, a few facts and information. So essentially, the menopause is when the ovaries stop producing eggs and your periods stop. So that is technically um, what the menopause is. Now, this occurs when there's a drop in um, the two main hormones for women, estrogen and progesterone. Now, you may find a drop also in testosterone, because that's, again, um, a little known fact that, that women have testosterone too. Um, and for some people, um, some women that go through the menopause, one of the hormones that also gets topped up, um, because you'll be aware of hormone replacement therapy, it isn't always just estrogen and progesterone that's getting topped up some women also um, are given testosterone um, as well now the average age that women go through the menopause is 51 but it's worth bearing in mind that that is just the average and obviously as i've demonstrated through my own story the menopause can happen at you know at, at various points and over a, a long period of time and i certainly know of and have made contact with um young women who who went through the menopause even earlier than i did you know people as as young as sort of 12 13 14 so it can happen essentially at any age and I think, again, that's one of the things that we don't always understand because we tend to associate it. And I certainly did. I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to go fat overnight um, and, you know, I'm going to start wearing hand knitted cardigans and like hush puppies. You know, I just thought it was something that happened to old ladies. But actually, as a woman who is now 48, so I'm kind of typically in that I'm getting towards that average age for menopause. I don't plan on wearing cardigans or getting fat or wearing hush puppies anytime soon. So I happen to think that 51 now is quite young um, for the average age of the menopause. But as you can see on the slide, you know, one in 100 women start the menopause um, before the age of 40, one in 1,000 before the age of 30. And like me, one in 10,000 um, are below the age of 20. So it gives you some idea of why it's so important for us to talk about this as a topic, because actually it can hit a woman pretty much at any stage um, in her life. There's four stages to the menopause. So there's premenopausal, which kind of does what it says on the tin. One that you might hear more typically is the perimenopause. So the perimenopause is when you're still having periods, but they've become irregular and erratic um, and you're starting to see some other changes. So that's when the perimenopause starts to hit usually the bit where women are kind of am I in the menopause? Am I not kind of what's happening to me? Being in the menopause, so that's stage three, is when your periods themselves have actually stopped and they've stopped for a period of, of uh, 12 months. And then there's postmenopausal, which again kind of does what it says on the tin. That's when you've come out the other side. Now, the next um, bullet point is the fact that the menopause can last for up to 12 years. Now, when I discovered that, I was totally stunned because let's put it in perspective. Puberty lasts an average of two years. So the menopause, which essentially is the other side and the unraveling of our puberty. And let's face it, we make lots of allowances, don't we, for teenagers when they're going through puberty? You know, the whole sort of Kevin and Perry, the grunting um, kind of thing, the mood swings and whatever else that goes on for two years. The menopause is the reverse of that. So the same sort of stuff happens that goes on for up to six times longer. So it, that's why for me, we need to educate about it and we need to raise some awareness because, you know, it's a long period of time. And also the other thing is there is no test for the menopause. So whilst a lot of women will go, they'll get blood tests from their GP, there isn't actually a single test for the menopause. There is nothing that will say you are in the menopause. Your blood test results might show varying hormone le levels, but on any one given day, your hormones might all be good and, and, and bouncy and, you know, at the level they would be that if you weren't in the menopause. So a blood test is only ever, you know, a point in time and those hormones could drop the day afterwards and your blood hasn't been tested at that point. So there isn't a single test um, for the menopause. So if anybody tells you that there is, um, your, especially your doctor, and I'll talk about doctors in a minute, um, then don't believe them because there isn't a test. Now, I guess the other part of, of my story and my background, so of course, there's the part of my story that's about the fact that I personally went through the menopause very early, and that's why it became a passion. But the other part is, 
I was an HR professional for 25 years. I worked in some very large corporate organizations. I worked for some of the world's largest employers, some of its most recognizable brands in terms of my background. And over that 25 year career, um, where I was progressively more senior up until, you know, I was a statutory board member in a couple of organizations. I worked with, I talked to, I interviewed thousands of people as an HR professional, both within those organizations as potential employees, as, as contractors and suppliers. I worked with literally thousands of people over the course of that career. And I can honestly, hand on heart, tell you that never once did a woman come and say to me, I want to talk to you because I think I'm in the menopause. Not one woman came and talked to me about their menopause in that 25 year career. Similarly, never once did a line manager come to me and say, I've got this lady in my team and she's struggling with something. And, and you know, he may or may not have known if it's the menopause, but never once did a line manager come and say, I need some support with a woman in my team and, and you know, that be menopause related. So for me, that again is what makes me passionate because the more I learned about it, the more I learned about my own experience, what I've been through, the fact that I then, you know, eventually started being quite open with the fact of that I've gone through the menopause and whatever else. So I felt like I was approachable about the menopause, but not a single woman came and talked to me about it. And that also makes me passionate about talking about it at work because we need to start opening up that dialogue because I cannot imagine in all the women that I work with that there were not women who were struggling and suffering as a result of the menopause. So what are some of the things that then we should be looking out for? And again, these are things that we could be looking out for in ourselves. It could be about um, employees that we work with. It could be that you're a line manager of those employees. So again, I'm really passionate about the fact that it doesn't matter if you're male or female. It's really important to understand what kind of things we should be looking out for when it comes to the menopause. Now, here's a bit of data for you. There are currently recorded over 60 different symptoms of the menopause. And I think that list is growing all the time. So over the time that I have been, you know, working with, talking about experiencing my own menopause, you know, that list has started to grow because as research gathers, as we start paying it more attention, the number of symptoms does seem to be increasing. When I started talking about some of this stuff, the number of symptoms was typically about 30 something and now there's up to 60 over 60 that are listed now the thing we have to remember with those symptoms and the reason that the menopause can be really difficult to diagnose and to understand is that for any one woman they may or may not get any of those symptoms as they go through the menopause as they go through that menopause and bearing in mind as we said it could be up to 12 years some of those symptoms they might get once, others of those symptoms might last the entire time and others might just come and go throughout that period of time. Also, if we think about those different symptoms, for most of those symptoms, they operate on a spectrum of severity. So at any one time, the severity of those symptoms and any one particular symptom might be completely different. You might suffer really badly, for example, with hot flushes at one point and then never have one again. You might get hot flushes later on and they're not as bad as they were the first time you had them. So that's why it's a very complicated picture of how we understand, you know, what is the menopause? Am I going through it? Now, I will admit I do have a bit of a thing um, when it comes to talking about the menopause, about the support that we get from the National Health Service and particularly from GPs. I am known to give them a little bit of a bashing because I know for a fact that the training that GPs get around the menopause is appalling. It's woefully inadequate. It's like, um, as, as one trained GP said to me once, in her GP training, the menopause was just a tiny mention in amongst one other module that had a load of other stuff in it. So they get hardly any training. So one of the things that I campaign about is trying to get more training for GPs so that they better understand. At the end of the day, 51% of the world's population are female and almost 100% of those females are going to go through the menopause in their lifetime or experience it in some way. So why the hell we don't know more about it and train more about it is a question that we need to be asking. 
So a lot of women find when they are trying to understand if they're going through the menopause themselves, they find it difficult because there's 60 different symptoms and you know there's a long list and things come and go. But also when they go to their GP, obviously a number of the, the symptoms could be indicative of something else. It could be the menopause, it could be something else. What a lot of women end up doing is actually going to their GP because they're worried that they have dementia. That's what often prompts women to first go to their GP. And as you can see on the list, there are some of the most common symptoms, the memory issues. So brain fog, low mood, anxiety are very, very common issues in the menopause, maybe for short periods of time, maybe throughout the menopause. But that's often what prompts women to actually seek a doctor's advice. Now, Brain fog, you know, memory issues, low mood anxiety, again, could be indicative of a lot of things. And actually what many, many women find is they come away from their GP with a prescription for antidepressants. One thing that's really interesting, though, is that what causes the low mood and anxiety during menopause is something that antidepressants doesn't fix. So because it's hormone related and then antidepressants are there for a different chemical imbalance, a lot of those women firstly will go, well, actually, I kind of don't feel depressed. It doesn't feel like that and end up confused in the first place. But they then get medication that actually doesn't do anything to help them. So again, it's really important that we gather information about the symptoms that are going on. And that's why the takeaway sheet that's available from today is actually about those symptoms. It's a, it's a checklist of those symptoms that whether you want to use that yourself, if it's relevant to you, whether it's something you want to give to a loved one, a partner, um, a friend um, or somebody else at work, what it's really useful to do is to record those symptoms and the severity of them over a bit of a period of time, because then when you go to the doctor, you've got some sort of evidence. You can go, right, actually, I've got these things. I'm seeing these things coming up on a recurring basis, because that will help the GP to actually understand that it's the menopause and you start that conversation because a lot of them put you off and there's some horrific statistics about women having to go to their GP numerous times to get help um, but actually having that checklist building a bit of a picture putting the jigsaw together both for yourself and for your GP when you go there is actually a really important thing to do so I, I advocate that a lot so you can get that um, takeaway document but we'll be emailing, emailing that out um, to anybody that signed up for the session. So these are some of the things about signs and symptoms. And I guess beyond that, you know, it's about why did I become the midlife mistress? You know, obviously, you know, I went through my own menopause and that became incredibly important to me. Then, like I said, there was the layering on of the fact in my corporate life, there was just no dialogue. Occasionally, maybe somebody made a comment about, oh, you know, is it me or is it hot in here? And everybody would like giggle uncomfortably. But that would be the end of it. So for me, it's about raising our game and raising our dialogue. And we do that by raising our awareness and talking about stuff. You know, I have lost count of the number of times in the work that I do that I have to say the word vagina um, because we just need to become more comfortable with talking about parts of our bodies that we maybe don't talk about very often and making that just part of our dialogue. I'm not saying if you're a line manager that you need to be going around and sitting down with somebody and using the word vagina um, every other minute, but it is about saying we've got to become more comfortable with talking about some of this terminology so that we allow people the space to speak up. And I wanted to change and improve the world of work um, for women, but also to do that by bringing men along with us too. And that's why one of the latest sessions in this series is specifically about talking about the menopause for men and actually answering some of those questions. And um, the gorgeous Paul Porter um, is going to join me for a bit of a Q&A session um, so that we can talk a little bit about what's on men's minds when they're dealing with the menopause. Because I say that for every woman that's going through this, there is a man somewhere, either, you know, a partner, a son, a brother, a friend, you know, a line manager, um, you know, a colleague, who is probably also sitting there going like, what the hell is going on here? You know, particularly with some of those things about mood swings and, um, you know, the hot flushes, which tends to be you know, often more visible. You know, we need to help the men to understand. We can't just go, you don't get it if we are not prepared to talk to them and educate them as we go along. And, you know, for me, when I went through it, I felt totally isolated. I didn't know anybody else in my peer group. Um, who was experiencing what I was experiencing. I didn't even know how to speak about 
at it because I was so embarrassed that at 32, I was now a postmenopausal woman. Um, but I don't necessarily think that's to do with my age. I find it a lot now when I speak to women that they talk about it, you know, very much in hushed tones and as if we should be ashamed. And I want women to understand that it isn't just them. If they're experiencing, you know, certainly any of these signs and symptoms and any of the others um, that are on the list, then we really need to make it possible for them to speak up and say something because the statistics around women who leave their jobs as a result of the menopause, the impact of its symptoms on their work life, but also the embarrassment, the inability to speak up in their workplace. The number of women that leave their, their workplaces is horrific. The numbers are way too high. And we also need to make sure that we're not losing that amazing talent from out of our business. You know, again, I'm 48 years old. I'm soon to be 49. I'm sort of nicely in that average age bracket. I would hate to think that somebody would think that I no longer had something to offer just because I'd hit the menopause. And we have to remember now that given life expectancy, nearly a third of a woman's life now will be spent postmenopausal. So I think women still have a lot to give even after this point in their lives. So um, just as a, a final point, I think, again, talking about the fact that that isolation and that feeling that it, it's kind of it's it's just me. Um, I found just recently uh, an amazing quote by the awesome Brené Brown. If anybody um, doesn't know about Brené Brown and her work, I would say go and find out because she talks a lot about shame um, in society. And it was wonderful because I, I found a quote um, that was called I thought it was just me um, from from her book. So I just wanted to finish by saying that and, and leaving us to think a little bit about, you know, how we can make sure we get rid of the shame. So that quote says, our culture teaches us about shame. It dictates what is acceptable and what is not. We weren't born craving perfect bodies. We weren't born afraid to tell our stories. We weren't born with a fear of getting too old to feel valuable. Shame comes from outside of us and from the messages and expectations of our culture. What comes from the inside of us is the very human need to belong, to relate. So for me, that says everything about the fact that we need to create safe spaces for people to be able to speak up and not feel so alone. So thank you for your attention. Um, I wanted to throw it open now in case anybody had any questions for me or comments even. Hello, Tom. Karen, thank you. That was that was really fantastic. Uh, this is something I don't know enough about as a man and a, as an employment lawyer. So I'm looking forward to all the sessions. I just wanted to sort of to gauge your view as to whether or not you think that this lack of understanding and lack of support has perhaps been a contributing factor towards the um, the gender disparity in senior roles within organisations. Um, I, I think it's very possible. I think it'd be difficult to tell, but certainly, um, I mean, I, I, I have views anyway in terms of the gender disparity. I do think mm -hmm. that, you know, I think it's great that we're trying to get, you know, more women to senior levels in organisations. But I actually also do think that women look at what goes on at those senior levels and what it takes and the hours and, and the behaviours and whatever that go on in, let's face it, mostly male led organisations, because mm -hmm. the majority of them still are. I think a lot of women just look at it and think, well, Fuck that I don't want to you know I don't want a part of that um so I think that's an issue anyway but you then add to that you know particularly when I go back to the symptoms you know the idea of um you know brain fog memory issues you know again I talk to lots of women who are sort of in this range and they get really panicky about remembering stuff you know there's lots of them say I get halfway through a sentence and I can't remember the rest of it or they can't remember certain words for things and you know, and, and again, you know, that's why a lot of them go to the doctors, you know, thinking they've got dementia. Um, but actually in itself, you know, you then try and translate that, you know, I've sat in boardrooms, um, um, like I said, and the idea that you're sitting there and then suddenly, I don't know, a hot flush will just hit you out of nowhere. Um, the fact that you won't be able to remember words for things, you know, all of that going on in you know, what is, you know, it's a public arena, isn't it, when you're, you know, a senior leader and you're sitting with other senior leaders, and particularly where they're men. And again, that's why we need to generate that understanding, because we need to make it 
more comfortable. But do I think it contributes? Yeah, because the statistics around women that are leaving the workplace because of their menopause, mm-hmm. um, like I said, are, you know, are shocking. And so, yeah, we're losing that talent. So inevitably, there's there's a small pool of women to choose from for those senior roles. It gets even smaller when they go through the menopause because they're bailing out. And if you've got, I suppose, male decision makers who aren't aware of this incredible challenge that that um, women are facing, then they're not going to be accommodating that, are they? When it comes to things like promotion opportunities and performance management, and things like yeah. that, they're just going to think, well, you know, she's not up to the task without understanding that she's going through something um, which male um, her male counterparts can't even fathom. No, absolutely. And that's, you know, again, if you look at the data and the statistics, that's why a lot of women leave their jobs because they they feel their performance dipping. They don't feel able to do the job as well as they used to anymore. Now, some of that is to do with confidence, because when suddenly your body goes through some of these dramatic changes, and as much as I joke about it, you know, for a lot of women, they do find that they gain weight, you know, almost overnight. You can read things where it's like, oh, my God, I'm almost like I woke up in like, you know, a fat suit. You know, I don't know what happened. So, you know, there's a lots of loss of confidence um that goes on and yeah they a lot of them a lot of the women themselves are trying to work it out so again we can't blame the men for you know not fathoming it either but if we raise awareness you know it's again like being flexible in terms of work because sometimes you know symptoms vary day to day even hour to hour sometimes um you know thinking about if you're running um management meetings or you know, if a woman says, do you think, would you mind if I switched off the heater or open the window or whatever? And, you know, and actually thinking, you know, taking a moment to think, well, OK, let's let's kind of go with that and, and let that happen. So it is it is about trying to make sure that men are aware that, you know, there might be some things that they can do that can make things easier. One of those sessions is going to be specifically aimed at us, isn't it, you said? Later yeah, in the course. So, yeah, I look forward yeah. To yeah and and what'd be great Tommy you know if you've got questions that you maybe want to submit beforehand or you know contact me directly or, or whatever but um you know or through Nicole by all means if you've got questions of things that are on your mind then please send them in because then Paul and I will actively make sure that we talk about those um during the session that'd be great um you know and, and similarly any other guys that might be listening in or any women that want to ask questions on behalf of guys that'd be amazing because then we can make sure we cover those but yeah you know like I said we can't we can't blame men if we don't talk to them about it but I do understand I mean there is honestly I can tell you as a woman that if you mention the menopause, it like guys are like cockroaches, like it clears a room like faster than most of the topics. <laughs> so, so it's like, so yeah. the thing is, we have to kind of try and coax the men back in and go like, come on, let's let's make it less less uncomfortable. Maybe we won't necessarily make it more com- comfortable for them, but less uncomfortable would just be good. But it shouldn't be anything that we should be uncomfortable about. I mean, it's a bit precious for us to be uncomfortable about it when we don't even have to experience it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, I love your attitude, Tom. I wish every guy was like, I promise you. The, I wouldn't give us too much people. credit there, Caroline. I don't <laughs> think it's too much to ask to just learn enough about it to to understand and to be to be approachable about it as a line manager or as a director or something, you know, so that so that people feel that they can show it. I don't think that's too much to ask. No, I, I don't think that it is. But I think, you know, inevitably, like anything that's a bit of a taboo and whatever, you know, women don't talk to each other enough about no. it. You know, they really don't. And, uh, you know, honestly, like the um, weekend before last, um, I went to lunch with my sister um, who's going through the menopause. My sister is, is 51 and um, with a bunch of her friends, actually, who are all of a similar age. And then gradually, like the conversation comes out and I'll have to be honest, it was a bit like I was like running a bit of a menopause workshop um, because the lack of understanding and the lack of talking about it, you know, and they, these are really close friends. They're lovely women. Mm. They're really close friends. But it took a while for them to, to warm up and actually sort of declare what they were experiencing. So even amongst women, it's still uncomfortable. Mm. Thank you for your engagement. It's lovely. It's lovely to have you here. It's lovely to have the attitude that you. No, it's been really interesting. I'm looking forward to the next one. Good. Thank you. Any other comments or questions before we close? I'm conscious that we've done about half an hour now. Anything? I just want to say thanks, Caroline, for uh, for a great session. And I think the the bit that resonates with me when you started saying, um, you know, all the time you worked as a HR professional, no one ever came to you and asked you that question, and and no one ever said, "Well, you know, I I may have somebody I need some support." And that's the thing 
no one's ever asked me about it. No one has ever, ever come to me about that. And, and I think there's so much awareness now with so many other things mm. in the workplace and employers' responsibilities that it probably is the last thing that's not been kind of, you know, tackled or or really kind of, you know, managed particularly well within the workplace. So and as you say, it's not just the workplace, it's outside. So, so, so thanks. I think the, the next session we've got, as it says on the screen there, 29th of March, one o'clock. Um, what we what we got coming up in the next one? I know we've got sort of we've got another three to go, haven't we? We have. Um, so as it says there, kind of hot topic or latest fad. Really want to talk about why it should be important to employers. Um, which you know, I know that Thrive as an organisation already think it's important, and that's that's amazing. But it's really about trying to furnish um, people with the idea of when you're then interacting potentially with your clients as well about why should they be thinking about this as a topic. You know, why is it important? So we we'll look a little bit. You know, I don't want to get too legalistic because clearly that's your stuff and it's not mine. Um, but it's you know, it's talking about why we should be taking it seriously because what what's the impacts of not? Um, and you know, for me. Um, you know spoiler alert I don't think it is just the latest fad um, it could be a game changer if we start embracing it 